Welcome, honored guests. My name is Wednesday Adams. I live in this house, the Adams Mansion, with the rest of my family. Let me show you around. After watching all this Wednesday stuff, I thought, you know what? We need a way to have visions to see into the future. <laughs> yeah. On this show. So I decided, you know, this was sitting next to my bed and collecting dust and I moved it in by my computer and I was looking the other day and I saw it on the shelf right next to me, literally within arm's reach. The magic eight ball. <laughs> nice. So whenever we have something on the show, we don't know the answer to since Nobody seems to write in and correct us. We're just going to consult the Magic 8 Ball to tell us what. Why not? <laughs> Here's a little background on the Magic 8 Ball. Used for fortune telling or seeking advice. And according to Wikipedia, it was invented in 1946 by Albert C. Carter and Abe Bookman. Albert Carter was inspired by a spirit writing device used by his mother, Mary, a Cincinnati clairvoyant. When Carter approached store owner Max Levinson about stocking the device, Levinson called Abe Bookman, Levinson's brother-in-law and graduate of Ohio Mechanics Institute. And in 1944, Carter filed for a patent for the cylindrical device because there's a cylinder inside with an icosahedron that has the answers. And it was partially inspired by a gag in the 1943 Stooges short, You Nazi Spy. From now on, when we don't know the answer to a question on this show, we're just going to consult the Magic 8-Ball. Okay, that works for me. <laughs> Johanna, what have you been up to since we last talked? I just got back from CinemaCon, a week-long event out in Las Vegas where all of the movie studios come and present information about the blockbusters coming this year. So I got to see... 20 minutes from the new Mission Impossible film. I got to see a chase scene from the new Indiana Jones film. Trailers for all sorts of movies that are coming out later this year. 10 minute clip on 70 millimeter of Oppenheimer, which is incredible. And then a couple full length films. It was really exciting. Lots of studio execs talking about their love of the theatrical experience. <laughs> so big cheerleading sesh. <laughs> Their love of the theatrical experience, but apparently not their love of the writers. Yeah, there was there were some sly jokes uh, infused by some of the talent. The movie stars and folks who were coming to this thing was crazy. People you'd expect like Martin Scorsese, but also like Oprah and Rihanna and like anybody who's got a voice part in an animated film showed up. Vin Diesel went off script and cried on stage. It was it was nuts. <laughs> Wow. What number CinemaCon is this? How long has it been going on? Oh, gosh. Um, I think it must be going for at least 30 years because it didn't always happen in Las Vegas. And it used to be called Show West. But the National Association of Theater Owners, also known as NATO, has been organizing this for quite a while. And it's their opportunity to get the blockbusters in front of the people booking the films so that they prioritize them and make sure that they have good screen time. All right, so let's jump into this. We're talking about Wednesday Adams in the 1990s and the 2000s. I wanted to sort of talk about some of the Adams family stuff that is less talked about, like the 1992 Adams family cartoon. So this came after there was renewed interest in the Adams family due to the film adaptations that came out. So we watched a segment, really it was one of the cartoons from one of the shows, Little Bad Riding Hood. Debbie Derryberry plays Wednesday Adams, and she tells a story called Little Bad Riding Hood, a bedtime story to Pugsley. I definitely remember watching this cartoon as a kid. So... It really took me back to when I was four or five years old watching Cartoon Network at my grandmother's house. And that way I can't really judge it objectively because 
had a soft spot for it. Love hearing the opening theme. I think they do a really good job with the intro to the show. And the voice talent, you know, I think is pretty solid, actually. I don't remember this cartoon, but probably because it came out the year I graduated. It came out the fall after I graduated. I was looking at the dates. It ran from like September 92 to November 93. But it fell right in between the Adams Family and the Adams Family Values movies. So it makes sense that I would have never heard it. So it was interesting to watch another cartoon adaptation. It was fairly colorful like the one in the 70s, but it was definitely 90s animation. <laughs> but it was fun to watch. It, it was neat to see their take on the characters. It reminded me a lot of when we watched the Beetlejuice animation. Yes. It's right around that same time. And as a matter of fact, there's a part when the wolf shows up, the big bad wolf, and mm -hmm. that's like Pugsley, and he's like, my card. And I'm like, hey, that's directly out of Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The thing that struck me is that Little Bad Riding Hood has littler red riding hand with her, which is <laughs> thin. Yeah. With a little cape. I don't think before this point, Thing was specifically associated with Wednesday. At this point in time, at least with this cartoon, it seems like Thing has sort of become Wednesday's sidekick. Right. That kind of becomes important for when we get to Wednesday today. Yeah. On that note, I also like seeing in this episode they establish Wednesday's interest in writing and storytelling, which is not something I actually remembered from the other Adams Family movies. You know, I associated that as a new development of the TV show, but as it turns out, it's a solid part of her character. The one part in this that I was like, what the hell was tied your favorite cow to the bed? <laughs> What what was that about? That was bizarre. <laughs> I I was uh I was baffled by that one myself. Yeah, I I mean, there are so many moments in this TV show and the clips we watched and in some of the other shows where there are seemingly throwaway lines that make you go like, "Wait, what? What did they say? What sort of violence did they just propose?" And <laughs> you don't know whether to take all of it seriously, none of it seriously, or, you know, pick and choose depending on your pleasures. <laughs> I just thought that it was funny that Lurch kind of looked like Frankenstein. Lurch has always sort of been in that Frankenstein space. Yeah. Not exactly Frankenstein, mm -hmm. but he represents the tall monster character, you know? This is just my opinion. He looks a lot more the way I picture Frankenstein in Charles Adams' New Yorker cartoons. Gotcha. So this comes out between Adams Family movie mm -hmm. and Adams Family values. So it comes out in 92. Adams Family came out in 91 and Adams Family values came out in 93. Now, Wednesday really seems to take center stage at this point in the Adams family, definitely by the time we hit Adams family values. So I counted up all the Wednesdays. There's been eight people who have played Wednesday over the years. So, Oh, wow. I was having a conversation with someone the other day. I mentioned that we were doing the history of Wednesday Adams and it's like, Oh, that's a very short history. And I'm like, no, actually it's not. <laughs> but I think a lot of people, probably the majority of people, Associate Wednesday with Christina Ricci. Oh, yeah. So I wanted to get your guys' takes on Christina Ricci as Wednesday. Let's start with Johanna. So my impression from the two films, Adam's Family and Adam's Family Values, is that she's really portrayed as the straight man against these absurdly colorful, cheerful, Girl Scout, American Girl Doll type other little girls and like adult women who clearly these little girls would grow up to be like, you know, Christine Baranski, <laughs> like amazing seeing her sort of as a foil for Wednesday Adams. But she didn't strike me as being as dark or menacing as some of the other portrayals of Wednesday have been. But she is put up against such absurdly cheerful people that in contrast, she comes off as a very dark. Yeah. 
Okay, so nobody wants to go to Thanksgiving on this? Oh, no, I, <laughs> you, you know I love the Thanksgiving scene. That's the best Wednesday scene. Honestly, I love how that has been referenced in future Wednesday and Adam's Family things without any spoilers moving from that point on. Yeah, it's kind of cool they put their little stance on that like um yeah no white people came over here and just kind of messed things up for the indigenous so we're burning your city down <laughs> it's definitely dated and even its pc-ness is no longer very pc but yeah for the time even around that time i dressed as wednesday adams for halloween because so many people were like you look just like christina ricci back then not now, but back then they're like, you look so much like her. You should be Wednesday. And then my best friend found this dress from the thrift store that was like an absolute Wednesday dress. I had the brains and I went to the party at the warehouse where everybody dressed up. And some there are pictures of me like that out there somewhere. They had a professional photographer, but I was never able to track him down. <laughs> I just, I, I'll always remember the like, we cannot break bread with you. <laughs> And she's like, she's going off script. <laughs> I'm like, we, you will drink highballs. We will make. So let's talk about the new Adams family. So the new Adams family came on in the late 1990s, and all they really did was take scripts from the original Adams family from the 1960s. And this has a very um Nickelodeon feel to it to me oh, yeah you know I don't mm -hmm. think that's where it was but um this has um I'm not sure how you say her name Nicole Fugere Fugere as Wednesday who uh, turns out this is all she ever did this was the only thing she ever did as an actress I found her on social media please people don't bug her but um I found her on social media and she doesn't she doesn't have like hundreds of followers or thousands she has maybe hundreds of followers, but not thousands of followers, not millions of followers. And she's just a mom. She's just like has a normal life, not in the spotlight. I think she did pretty good, though, as Wednesday. And she definitely had the look, you know, she had a very um, Feruza Balk look with the piercing blue eyes and the black hair and all that. I, I was talking about those throwaway lines and she has one where she says something like, there were three children and Pugsley ate one of them. And yeah, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like that, that actually takes Adam's family to different territory. Cause you kind of get the sense, like she and Pugsley are always like playing pranks on each other or, or more often she has arranged some sort of elaborate torture scenario for him. But you get a sense that, like not no one will come to death or serious harm they the whole point is that they want to experience pain and fear and like get really close but that they all love each other underneath all of it and like they don't actually want each other they don't want to cause the death of each other like they kind of have a romantic idea about death but then this idea like that pugsley ate their younger sibling and that they're all just like kind of going on like a happy family after that is really yeah, yeah, was really totally a different fun. direction i thought for <laughs> for adam's family but wasn't sure did you guys pick up on that line was it a joke like what do you think i missed that line i can only assume it's a joke the weirdest thing is that pugsley i don't particularly like the pugsley character in any of the incarnations he just kind of gets picked on by everybody else he doesn't really have his own personality like there's nothing particularly scary or weird about him he's just a normal kid so i don't know it would be cool if that was true in adam's family lore but it also be very out of place with the rest of the family so i don't know i wonder if some of it is that like a boy with cruel and violent tendencies is actually like legitimately scary and off-putting whereas a girl with dark and violent tendencies can be amusing or you can like assume it's a joke like no no woman no girl like this would ever be real but like a boy that way you know those are the school shooters of the future <laughs> so like I wonder if they they had to make Pugsley kind of a, a doughier like softer sibling for that reason 
I don't remember what Charles Adams' description of Pugsley was, but he created like character sketches, and I don't mean just like um, drawings, but actual like descriptions of them for the TV show or whatever. And I don't remember what he said about Pugsley. I do remember his description of, of Wednesday was that she should be satanic. That was his description of Wednesday, but I don't remember what Pugsley was supposed to be. So my take on this particular episode, and I'll let you guys say what you thought, but I thought for one thing, color does not necessarily improve the Adams family. No, agreed. So reshooting the same scripts in color, I don't think it really helped. It also didn't help that in general, not Nicole, but in general, I don't think the cast was as good as the original Adams family. The terrible theme song that they replaced the classic opening music with the finger snap. Yeah. Like, why did they do that? Because that's like, that's, that's classic Adams family right there. You know, maybe there's a copyright issue. (laughs) I wish they would have kept the original theme song. It would have made more sense and tied everything together a little bit, but. The copyright issue is all I can think of. Yeah, Yeah. probably. But my biggest complaint is that the tone here, it's more like the Monkees TV show than the Addams Family. It was just a little too wacky hijinks. Yeah. For my taste. Yeah, definitely giving off Nickelodeon vibes with with, with the show and the quirky comedy twist to it that they added. And it was, you know, it it really was too colorful (laughs) for the Addams Family. I don't know. Every everybody has their own different versions and opinions and I'm sure that they were trying to make it different. It was okay at best. But I wanted to point out one thing in this, which is the end credits thanks Lady Colleyton, C O L Y T O N. Mhm. So I was like, who is that? And so I looked it up and that is actually Barbara Barb. Adams' second wife who resembled Morticia. Not to be confused with Barbara Day, which was Adams' first wife who resembled Morticia. Barb was later known as Lady Colleyton, a.k.a. Baroness Colleyton, because she married a baron, and she allegedly used, in this is a direct quote, diabolical legal scheming, unquote, to get control of the Adams Family TV and film franchises until 2010 when Marilyn Matthews Miller, also known as T, I don't know why she, her nickname's T, Adams's third wife who resembled Morticia, who he married in a pet cemetery. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be married in a pet cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> she was able to reclaim the rights for the T and Charles Adams Foundation. So it was Lady Colleyton who, I don't know what the take on it is. Obviously, Marilyn doesn't really like her, but whatever. I think we got to give her a little bit of credit, though, because she was in control of this when the Raul Julia, um, you know, the Adams Family and Adams Family Values movies came out. That was because of her control over this property and the Adams Family TV show fell in that time period, too. You can find out a lot more about the T and Charles Adams Foundation at the website. All right, that brings us to Melissa Hunter's Wednesday Adams. Comedian Melissa Hunter did a web series which was on YouTube, but it got banned. But now you can still find it at itsmelissahunter.com. She did this popular YouTube series. This is the equivalent of fanfic made into a show. This is where fans make a take on a character and they make their own movie or TV show or whatever. And this is her reimagining Wednesday Adams as a adult. And having to live in the adult world. It's clearly based more on the sarcastic Christina Ricci version of Wednesday. But many people believe the modern Wednesday show on Netflix stole from this show. Even though it's the subject of a copyright dispute. 
this is kind of a band show right now, but you can still see it because she's fighting it in the courts. I recommended we watch the job interview, which I wouldn't have done. Rosie, sorry, had I known your job situation at, at the time I recommended this. Yeah. No, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> oh, I thought it was great. Her take on uh, Wednesday Adams as a young adult was perfection because, you know, the only thing I would change is I would change the way that she dressed and wore her hair because I feel like Wednesday wouldn't be wearing braids in her 20s. She'd do something different with her hair. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I loved it so much I had to go back and watch all the others. I had just picked this one out, yeah. you know, but then I was like, I got to go watch some of the other episodes because this is too good. What would you think, Johanna? One of the things I really liked about this was how it brought out a character trait of Wednesday that we kind of see in her childhood form, but we definitely see in the Wednesday TV show, and I think this is something that they borrowed, is her strong moral compass. She's got a really dark sense of humor, or possibly no sense of humor at all, depending on your interpretation, but kind of at the core of it is a very strong internal sense of what she thinks is right and wrong that guides the way she acts in the world. You see this a little bit with the job interview, but you see it a lot in some of the other clips. Like there's a great one where she's babysitting and trying to tell this little girl that there are only three kinds of monsters and that she doesn't have to worry about them because monsters only go after other monsters. And it's actually like, really touching you know all of the darkness is there she's definitely saying like there are monsters like no buts about it but you know then emphasizes but you're you're good and inconsequential is the word she uses she's like you don't matter (laughs) so the monsters won't come for you but kind of in there is a sense of like the monsters won't come for this little girl because she hasn't done anything wrong so i liked seeing that part of adult wednesday being really sure about her sense of the world. Like I said, I loved it, but I also threw this in here, um, not only because a lot of people think it influenced the Wednesday show, but this is one of the reasons why the big corporations that make these things, they don't take unsolicited scripts traditionally, because if they have something similar in development, they don't want to get sued. A lot of this is a fallout from Coming to America, where Art Buckwald sued Paramount. It's an infamous case. The one exception was always Paramount, who owned the Star Trek franchise. And Star Trek, in its original run, some of the biggest fans were science fiction writers. So they would send in scripts. And so they get scripts from people like Isaac Asimov and uh, Harlan Ellison. Harlan Ellison, they, a couple of his scripts actually got made into episodes. And so Star Trek had a long history of accepting fan scripts, but something changed once fans got the tools to make stuff as good as theatrically released stuff. So when I was in Cincinnati, I worked with a director. One of the directors I first got involved with was a a guy named Mark Burchett, who's sadly passed away now, but I've worked with him a bunch of stuff. And he worked on a show called Star Trek Continues, which was a fan-made Star Trek show. And then I moved to the middle of nowhere, Vermont. And crazy enough, there's a fan here named Matt Busey, who was the director of photography on it. And so we bonded over that. But their show eventually got a cease and desist letter from Paramount because basically it was too good. That's what it comes (laughs) down to. It was too good. What's your take on fan made stuff where the fans don't own the copyright or even have a license to it? And Johanna, I'm the pitch this to you for reasons I'm sure you can figure out. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting about it is um, that parody is is covered by fair use, but it seems like if you are too loving towards the original source material or not making fun of it in the right ways, then you get cracked down upon. And um we we've seen this uh, very publicly and recently with a film that premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival uh, this past uh, September 2022 called The People's Joker. 
Uh, it's it's a film that uh, the programmers loved. It basically takes characters from the DC universe, primarily Joker, but also Harley Quinn, Batman, Robin, Penguin, um, whole cast of characters, and uses those characters to tell a a trans coming of age story, which is, you know, very powerful and sort of in an interesting way, using these characters in this familiar universe gives people outside of the trans community a way in of understanding that journey in a different way. So it's a really great example of using one piece of IP or art in order to explore something completely different. In this case, like comedy is part of it. Like part of it is exploring things that make us laugh. I mean, you think about Spaceballs, for instance, it's using Star Wars to explore jokes. Like, <laughs> like what are things that make us laugh? And People's Joker has humor in it for sure, but it's also exploring this, you know, much deeper, more interesting, you know, emotional landscape. Anyway, Warner Brothers, like two days before the screening was supposed to happen, suddenly wrote a seat synthesis letter saying, like, you can't do it. And it, you know, it was two days before the screening at the major festival, and it was really just kind of too late. And fortunately, the director, Vera Drew, managed to get lawyers to talk Warner Brothers down so that the screening could happen. But then the film has been in legal trouble ever since. So, you know, hoping that other folks are going to get a chance to see this, it's hard to find (laughs) right now. That's all, all we can really say about it. But hopefully this issue of fair use and parody will get cleared up. But at the heart of it, it comes with a lot of love for the original material and a belief in that material's potential to tell even bigger, more interesting stories. Some other Batman related fan films out there, if you guys can find it. Batman Dead End is another one that comes to mind. Batman fans are crazy in their love for the character and making fan made stuff. I saw the People's Joker. I thought it was pretty good. But Warner Brothers is just very litigious in this way or very at least aggressive. I don't know if they'd actually take it to court, but in Cincinnati, we used to have a goth club that was called Gotham. Now it had nothing to do with Batman or anything like that. It was just the name of the club, Club Gotham, and they got a cease and desist and had to change their name at some point. What did they change their name to? Do you remember? I don't remember that place. I don't remember. Okay, so it was on Main Street. It was around the same time Deviate was around. I don't know if you remember Deviate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I went to deviate. Okay. So it was around the same time as deviate. They were rival sort of clubs, goth clubs at that time. Anyway, I don't want to get down a rabbit hole because our viewers are international and we're getting way too provincial here. I will say this. I find it awfully odd that Warner brothers would decide to sue over a movie of a trans coming of age story of course they want to freaking shelve it i mean it just makes sense you know forget the copyrights forget the money it just is so typical well I'm sorry yeah and i think that's the heart of it is that certain kinds of parodies are allowed if it if it can still adhere to certain core identities of that franchise and so the fact that like batman in the dc universe is so masculine and macho uh i mean especially portrayals of the joker traditionally have been um Mm -hmm. and and that this film is take taking that character and uh letting letting that character belong to a totally different community i think is is one of the main reasons they object to it is that it's tarnishing the brand in some way and you know they're wrong (laughs) <laughs> I right there's lots of room under this umbrella <laughs> yeah there really is let's get back to wednesday related stuff the last one i wanted to talk about leading up to the wednesday of today like melissa hunter's adult wednesday a lot of people think this show 
had a lot of influence on Wednesday, and some even consider it a direct continuation of this series. Hmm. And that's Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. I'll have to finish watching that series. I started watching it, but I never finished it. So I'm just going to give the sort of synopsis of chapter one, which is the first episode. So this is based on the old Archie comics. So back to the comics again. This is based on the Archie comics character, Sabrina, the teenage witch. Sabrina Spellman is in high school in this, and she basically, it's your regular high school. It's not Riverdale, where the rest of the Archie characters go to high school. This is Baxter High. In Greendale. In Greendale. Yeah, in Greendale. (laughs) And she hangs out with her boyfriend, Harvey, and her best friends, Roz and Susie. But she's approaching her 16th birthday, which is on Halloween. And she's supposed to undergo a dark baptism in which she'll pledge loyalty to the Dark Lord Satan, after which she'll leave her school behind and her friends behind and go to the Unseen Academy of Dark Arts, which is apparently some Harry Potter school. (laughs) And she's torn between her friends and her two aunts who insist she be baptized. And while she's trying to sort this out, Her favorite teacher, Mary Wardwell, is killed and impersonated by one of Satan's loyal witches to sort of push her toward going through with the ritual. On the other side of the coin are the weird sisters who are kind of like the mean girls who rule the school at Unseen Academy of Dark Arts. And they don't want a half-breed like Sabrina attending because apparently like her, one of her parents was like a normal, like a muggle or whatever they call them in this. Her mom. Yeah. Yeah. While at Baxter High, there are a bunch of bullies that are picking on Susie. So the girls decide to start an after school uh, support group. The Women's Intersectional Cultural and Creative Association, Wicca. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, this this show definitely has tongue in cheek at times. But the principal, Hawthorne, Principal Hawthorne won't agree to it. So... On the suggestion of the Dark Lord minion the posing as Miss Wardwell, they put a spider curse on him because he's terrified of spiders. And it's pretty scary, actually. Then at some point, Sabrina decides to tell her boyfriend that she's a witch and all this stuff. And he, like, rightfully freaks out. So she magically wipes his memory, you know, does the Jedi mind trick on him. <laughs> so she realizes she needs protection because, you know, the weird sisters have cursed her and... She's got all these enemies out there. So she summons her familiar, which is a demon that takes the body of a cat named Salem, which Salem was kind of the breakout hit character from the 90s sitcom version of this. So I think a lot of people were unhappy that this show didn't have a wise cracking animatronic puppet, (laughs) but an actual black cat. And finally, Sabrina, she goes to her cousin, Ambrose, who says she's conflicted about this dark baptism. And he tells her to eat from the fruit of knowledge, which conveniently is this apple tree located nearby. You know? <laughs> so she goes to a farm to go eat this apple. But in order to get to the apple tree, she has to go through a hay and corn maze. And I say and corn because it's called a hay maze, but there's corn stalks every few feet. Like, I don't know if they're decorative or whatever, but it may be symbolic. But again, Nothing good ever happens in a cornfield. Nothing. So she gets chased by a scarecrow and finally gets to bite from the apple of knowledge and then ends up in what looks like the upside down from Stranger Things. All right, there we go. That's the sort of the synopsis for this episode. (sighs) Rosie, you want to go first with this? What's your take on this? As I was saying, I could see where people would think that Wednesday was kind of picking up where Sabrina left off. But did you notice that the three witch sisters, one of them looked like Wednesday? Her name was Agatha. She had the hair. She had the dress. Like, she looked just like her. So it was almost like Wednesday made a secret cameo appearance (laughs) in the show. I don't know if that was a nod on purpose, but just something I noticed. We're, like, birthing fan theories right here as we go. That's right. Fan (laughs) theories live and in person right here. Geek Channel 8. (laughs) Johanna, what about you? Any thoughts on uh, this in particular? 
<laughs> on this particular fan theory? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. On this episode in general or this fan theory. You no. <laughs> um, in general, one of the things that I noticed was the flavor blend in this show was very similar to Wednesday, like mystery mixed with whimsy, which I guess they discovered that that blend really worked for this character. Like you don't want to go full darkness because then you kind of lose your general audience. So seeing that play out here, I was very reminiscent. Also the sense of uh, students versus the school pitting Wednesday slash Sabrina against authority as you know, a major source of conflict in, in the series overall made a lot of sense. And then themes around social alienation, connecting that to what it feels like to be a teenager, whether you're a normal or a witch or Wednesday, sort of dialing in on how that theme would be relatable to all teenagers. You can definitely see parallels between the two shows there as well. But I hadn't actually heard of this show. I thought somehow that it was going to be like a callback to Sabrina the Teenage Witch starring Melissa Joan Hart. And so I was really glad that, I mean, I liked that show as a kid, but I was glad that it was something completely different and surprised to see how much it reminded me of Wednesday, which I had seen first. So did they trade down on the cat? (laughs) I thought the cat was just as good here. I thought it was good cat, good cat. I watched the show because Kieran and Shipka was on it, and I really like how well she did in Mad Men. You know, she played the daughter in Mad Men, and then she went on to do this, and, and I wanted to see how she did, and she really did a phenomenal job, and that was a main reason why when I saw the previews, I was like, this looks really good. I want to see how well she does this, and I was impressed. My takeaway is here, one, she's surrounded by normals rather than paranormals. We'll talk about this more when we talk about Wednesday, but I think that works a little bit better for a character like Sabrina. This show does not shy away from the Christian rights ire, though. It's like, Mm -hmm. no, it's Satan. It's not like we're not going to use a euphemism for it or anything. It's Satan, and she's got to pledge her loyalty to Satan, you know? Well, not just her loyalty, her virginity. Like, it's very serious. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Her virginity also, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And it has witches' marks and all that jazz. Um, so I like that about it. What I didn't like was I think it, they played it a little too safe when it came to using media in this. Like they used Night of the Living Dead, which I've seen in so many things as the thing that's on TV because, you know, it's in the public domain and so it's easy to get the rights to. But, you know, the they're coming to get you, Barbara, has been used so many times in so many shows. Also, Bad Moon Rising by Credence Clearwater Revival. Mm-hmm. It was really revolutionary when American Werewolf in London used that song. You know, it's like, oh, what the perfect song. And now so many movies having to do with vampires and werewolves have used that that I'm just like, you know, that is to vampire and werewolf movies what Creedence Clearwater Revival's Fortunate Son is to Vietnam films. <laughs> like, it gets used in all of them. The soundtrack in this, it's a lot of 60s music. Mm -hmm. So there's a weird 60s aesthetic going on here, which is, I guess, I mean, that's when the comics came out. So I I started coming out, you know. Yeah. So Hurdy Gurdy Man by Donovan. But the one I wanted to mention in particular is Be My Baby by the Ronettes, because we get Sabrina's dance. Now, Keep in mind Sabrina's dance because I'm going to come back to Sabrina's dance when we talk about dancing next time on the show. Yes. All right. So the Sabrina Be My Baby dance by the Ronettes. Uh, the um, the only other thing I had of note here is the spider scene reminded me a lot of the cockroach scene. I think the episode was called War of the Coprophages in the X-Files. Oh, wow. So if anyone remembers that. Was it just me or did did it seem like they were doing a callback to the X-Files on that? I think it's very likely. Love the X-Files. Anything else you guys want to say about Chilling Adventures of Sabrina? Just that I'm now going to go watch the rest of the season because, um, yeah, good performances. Uh, you know, I, I have to know whether she 
manages to save herself for Satan or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saving myself for Satan. <laughs> I need to like make some t-shirts that say that I could make so much money. <laughs> you really could. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm saving myself for Satan, I'm gonna watch Geek I'm gonna listen to Geek Channel 8. <laughs> that that might be yeah, that might be our merch. We might put that on our merch. We will talk more about the Netflix Wednesday show next time. In order to get the show out there, all we ask is you just Tell one other person about the show. All right. I'm over asking you guys to review the show and give us star ratings because it doesn't seem like you guys are doing that. So that's fine. Just tell one other person about the show. If you want to reach us, you can write us at GC8 podcast. That's letter G, letter C, number eight podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Eric. This is Rosie. This is Johanna. Signing off. I hope you've enjoyed your tour, and I hope you come back and see us again, soon.